Jesus. God the Son incarnate, the perfect one promised by prophets and priests. In both deity and humility, he dwelt among his people to usher in a new kingdom. When he entered the town, they cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he. Yet now this savior hangs suspended on a tree. The switch up was real. They had turned their backs on him. The shouts of Hosanna had turned to Barabbas quicker than a blink of an eye. Jesus, God the Son incarnate, gasping for breath, looked up to the heavens and with little strength he has left said, It is finished. Well, good morning. Why don't you stand and worship the risen Savior? Alone in my sorrows and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name And my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made From my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, be faithful you are. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began. There in the tomb, his body lay. The light of the world had been slain by darkness. Darkness laughed. Death took a victory lap. Let's go home then. Cut the lights on your way out. Seal the end of the story. Nah. That ain't how this story ends. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes
is alive, King Jesus reigns. And we're here to celebrate his resurrection. Thank you for being here at First Groves. You can have a seat. Good morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Amen. It's a privilege to be with you this morning for you choosing to worship with, with us. I'd like to say welcome. Thank you for choosing to do that. My name's Guy Burnham, and I'm one of the pastors here at First Baptist Groves. And it's my job this morning to say thank you for coming to worship with us. Amen? Amen. Amen. I would, if you would, take uh, one of the cards in the pew back. If you're visiting with us for the first time, I'd like to ask you just to fill that out with some information for you. We just want to know how we can meet your needs, how you can meet our needs as well. Um, it's a two two-way street with that, and I uh, just ask for you to fill that out. It's all we ask this morning for you to do that. Unless you have prayer requests also, you can put those on there and know that our prayer warriors will be lifting them up in prayer to our Lord and Savior. Uh, if you did not get one of these when you walk through the door, make sure you get one before you leave because it's got some valuable information for things that are happening later on in, uh, in the months. Uh, a couple of things listed there that will happen in May, so just be uh, Thinking about that, how you might participate with us, but also on here is saying that our life classes are still in full swing, and they're meeting on Wednesday nights, uh, so find a place to participate and uh, into fellowship with one another. I'm so glad you chose to come and worship with us this morning. Lots of opportunities along the roads to stop and have worship, but you chose to worship with us, and we, we are privileged to be able to do that with you. Stand if you would. We're going to ask our men to come forward take a time of offering, and I just want to lead us in prayer as we continue our time of praise this morning. Father, it's good to be in your house. We thank you for the privilege that you give us to serve you this morning, to serve you in worship with one another, and also, Father, to glorify you because of the significance of this day. You chose, Father, to come to this earth and you fulfilled a promise that you redeemed your people with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for that. And we recognize that on Good Friday, Father, but we also know that today is a great Sunday because we celebrate the resurrection of your son, that one who overcame death and now lives in victory, overcoming death so that we may also have life. Thank you for that. Father, Amen. continue with us in, a, in an atmosphere this morning of praise and honor to you. We give you praise and glory in Christ's name. Amen. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus went and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all Oh, pray. i 
This morning that Jesus Christ is alive? Do you believe that he was once dead and he defeated death? He defeated the grave and he died for you and me while we were yet sinners. Amen. That's the reason why we're here. It's to declare to Jesus this morning that you are our Lord and our Savior. And so we thank him this morning. We celebrate this morning. Today is a day that we should be jumping up and down, excited, like your favorite team just scored the touchdown. No doing this during worship, by the way. <laughs> We're so glad to be here, and it's so wonderful to see all of your faces. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we hear his word preached. Father God, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. To have the, the ability to even say that phrase right there. Lord, we thank you. We lift your name high this morning. We exalt you, which means we place you above everything, over everything else. And this morning, we celebrate the resurrection of your son, Jesus, signaling eternal life with you forever, if we believe. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us, all that you will do for you, for us, and for who you are, Jesus. And I thank you for the blood of Jesus that covers our sins. We love you and we pray this in your holy name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Amen. Amen. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Take your Bible, if you will. And turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's the half-court shot at the buzzard. It's the overtime catch in the Super Bowl. It's the stretch at the finish line. It's the walk-off home run in the bottom of the ninth. They all say one word. Victory. Victory. But nothing says victory like the Apostle Paul when he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he speaks about the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. He says this, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed." For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The Apostle Paul writes with such precision concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the importance and the foundation that the resurrection has to our faith. Apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have no hope. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, uh, the house of Christianity crumbles because there is no foundation apart 
from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so today we reflect in the long-standing tradition and really in light of the scriptural admonition of our Savior Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ is alive. And we celebrate the resurrection of Christ because it's the final proof of our faith. It's the evidence that Jesus Christ is alive and well. It's the foundation for everything that we believe. It's it's the revelation of who Jesus is. And throughout this month of March, we've been looking and trying to answer the question, who is Jesus? But when you ask that question, who is Jesus? If you cannot answer it with an affirmation that he was raised from the dead, then you don't know this Jesus of the New Testament that we have. It's essential. In fact, if you don't answer in the affirmative concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then we don't have a faith. With the resurrection, we have faith. And we have a foundation because of what Christ has given to us, because of what the Father has done as as he has declared for us our own salvation, declaring that he alone has defeated the last enemy, death itself. That Christ has accomplished. And so we gather in this long-standing tradition, belief, according to the New Testament, as spoken by the prophets hundreds of years in advance of, of the coming of Christ, that Jesus Christ is alive. And that he's alive from the dead. And that's why we worship him. And so it is Paul that gives us this incredible glimpse into the life of Jesus, this incredible hope that we have in in Christ so that that he boldly proclaims that that we will be transformed one day that that we will bear in in him we will bear the image of the in, invisible and the of the heavenly and that leaving behind our perishable bodies that that we will one day receive a new resurrected body in Christ Jesus Because of this, we gather as God's people, the children of God, this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, we gather to exalt the name of Christ and the exaltation of Christ. And the fourfold exaltation of Christ is first seen in the grand opening of Christ as he is raised from the dead. But that's not the end of the story. It's really just the beginning of the story as we gather and we we commemorate and we remember what Christ has done as he was raised from the dead. But even now, the story goes on because Christ ascended to the right hand of the Father and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us and one day will return for us. He will return. And so when you talk about the exaltation and the lifting up of the person of Christ, ultimately you're talking about his resurrection, you're talking about his ascension, and you're talking about his seating next to the Father who's interceding on our behalf and one day going to return in judgment someday, Revelation chapter 19. And so we gather as God's people because we believe that the return of the Lord Jesus Christ offers us, in light of the resurrection, offers us this hope of resurrection life. And so I want you to look in your Bible, beginning in verse 50, when we look at Paul, what he's writing here, as we look at this message this morning, the final proof of our faith, that we look at the secret associated with this resurrection. Notice what Paul says in verse 50 and 51. He says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. In other words, the natural body in and of itself will not inherit the things to come. Something has to have changed. There has to have been an occurrence. And he refers to this in verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So he's saying this. I want to show you something. I want to disclose to you something which was concealed in the Old Testament. It is something concealed in the Old, revealed in the New. And it is a full disclosure on our part today, on my part today. It is a revelation from God for you to understand. He calls it a mystery. Now, this is not some kind of mystery. It's some kind of secret knowledge that you develop by joining some club or some understanding of some organization. No, this is a mystery because it was once concealed but is now being revealed. But it is fully disclosed today. This is not the first time that Paul speaks about this mystery, this mysterion, as it's called in the New Testament language. He's he's spoken of it before. 
In fact, he'll speak of it in his doxology in Romans chapter 16 when he alludes to what Christ has accomplished and he celebrates and he, and he, and he, and he exalts the, the name of Christ going so far as to say, but now this has been disclosed to you in Revelation in Romans 16. It has been made known to all the nations. What is it that he's trying to make known? He's trying to make known the reality of the resurrection and its implications to our future life, to the lives that we live. In very practical terms, he's saying this when he writes the Thessalonians. He's saying, I know you have a concern for those who've died and have gone before you. What will happen to those who are dead and have, and have died and have gone before you? What will, come of, what will become of them? When the Lord returns, what will happen to them? And I began to think about the amount of time I have spent back-to-back. If I were just to put back-to-back days together of the number of days that I have spent at funerals, either, either, either overseeing a funeral or being with families that have grieved the loss of loved ones, I've spent at least two years of back-to-back days of my life contemplating, considering the death of people that I will no longer have to consider when I get to heaven. You know that? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he's saying, look, those that you have believed, that you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died having believed in Jesus, don't worry about them. They're okay. They're going to be okay. And if the Lord returns while you're still alive, you're going to be okay if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't believe, then you're going to be in trouble. There's gonna, you're going to have a problem. And yet Paul is saying this, because you believe, know this, this once which was concealed in the Old Testament, something which was not, not really readily understood is now been made known to you. This is the secret associated with the resurrection. That is, understand this mystery. It can be understood. It's something that you should understand. And so he describes the situation. He's saying in verse 50, flesh and blood uh, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, you don't just get into heaven uh, naturally. It has to come by supernatural means. In verse 51, all believers alive in Christ, uh, alive at Christ's coming, will go to heaven without dying. So if Jesus were to come back in the midst of me speaking, if you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ because of the resurrection, know this, that instantaneously you will go on to be with the Lord if he were to come back. And that offers hope to every one of us because we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection which lays the foundation for the return of Christ someday. Suddenly, this is going to occur. He says this event could happen in the blinking of an eye. That's how, that's how quickly this could happen. It could happen just like that, that the Lord could come back, and if you're ready, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to worry about, and you can be ready because of belief in the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. And so he says this, there's going to be a trumpet sound. This was an Old Testament symbol of the coming of the Lord. It was the announcement of the Lord. There's going to be a trumpet call. You will hear that trumpet call. If you're alive and well at the return of the Lord, listen, you will hear the trumpet call of the Lord. And instantaneously, you will be transformed and changed. This broken down body that you're living in, and that I've been reminded of this past week, of my own body, is this broken down bodies that we live in are going to be instantly changed, radically transformed in that moment in which the Lord signals his return to this earth. The last trumpet will signify the fulfillment of this promise. And so this will happen. Those who are departed, departed believers, people that you know, if you were to stand, if I were to ask you today to stand up and name your loved ones, the ones that you know who have confessed Christ as their Savior, the ones that you know have, have, have died and because of their faith in Christ Jesus are with the Lord today. If I were to ask you to stand up and just start calling out their name, it would be a glorious moment just to hear each and every one of their names spoken today. Two years ago, Easter Sunday, uh, two years ago, Donald Gill went to be with the Lord Jesus Christ on Resurrection Sunday. I remember that. Many of you, you know your loved ones. You know where they are. But maybe you don't know where they are. Maybe you're wondering about what happened. I know in the case of some of my family members, I've wondered, did they really know the Lord? What, what, what has become of their life? Honestly, the burden of my heart. 
wondering what has happened as they pass from this life into the next life. This is why we believe in the resurrection, because we believe that if someone believes in Jesus, that they will be raised from the dead, that, because they've confessed Christ as their Savior. And so all of those who have confessed Christ, one day we will see them again. For those who are alive and well at the return of the Lord, living believers, we will exchange these mortal bodies for immortal bodies. And that transformation will occur all because of what Christ has done for us, both in his death and in his life. Christ died once for all. I read this passage on Friday night in our Good Friday service, but I want to read this and allude to it again. Jesus Christ died once and he will never die die again Romans 6 says Christ will never die again death no longer has dominion over Christ Jesus so he defeated the good news today is that Jesus defeated death hell and the grave and this is what the prophet spoke of as well and so we need to understand the mystery of the resurrection but I want us to see something else the scriptural foundation to the resurrection in verse 54 the scriptural foundation, notice when the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality. It sounds like what gods are made of, right? Right? sounds like myth and saga and legend, but it's not myth and saga and legend. It's, it's reality for those who, who believe in Christ. Then it shall come to pass the saying that is written. What saying? Paul is quoting from two prophets, Isaiah and Hosea. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is, your, where, is, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul is quoting from the prophet Isaiah. Why would this be significant? Because Isaiah, 700 years in advance of the coming of Christ. Remember, this is the same prophet uh, who gives us as much of the gospel in the Old Testament as any Old Testament prophet that we have and we can hear from. He's the one who speaks of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, of a virgin conceiving and bringing forth a son in Isaiah 7, and the kingdom shall be upon his, his shoulders in Isaiah 9. And it's the prophet Isaiah which speaks of these realities hundreds of years in advance, and so he does so concerning uh, what Christ would accomplish when he would, when he would overcome death. And I, in fact, Isaiah ch ch chapter 25 and verse 8, Isaiah writes this, he will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people shall be taken away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So Isaiah says, speaking of Messiah, Messiah is going to come, and he's going to wipe away all tears. He's going to defeat death. He's going to swallow it up is the word that he used, the phrases that, that he uses here. He's going to swallow it up. In other words, death will no longer have any authority, will no longer have any dominion. It will no longer have any say-so concerning our lives. I look forward to that day, don't you? When death will no longer be able to speak when it comes to our lives. Think about the lost loved ones that you have. I mean, you know where they are, but the ones that you've lost that have gone on uh, 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 before you. I mean, death will no longer have any say. When we get to heaven someday, when that day arises, when we're there, with, death will have no authority, will not be able to speak to any reality that we live in when it comes to the reality uh, of heaven. Hosea also spoke of this reality as well. Hosea 13, 14 says, I shall ransom them from the power of the grave. In other words, the prophets saw and they knew that the problem of humanity was that, that no matter who you were, is that death had its grip on you. And Hosea said, but there's coming a one. Paul says he has arrived. And he declares him as the resurrected king, that he is the one who has come to set us free from the dominion of the grave. So that we no longer have to stand at the graveside. We no longer have to bear in our bodies the, the penalty of that sin. He says, no longer will death have a stinger in it anymore is the idea here, right? There will no longer be the painful thrust of, uh, uh, of the sting of death. It will no longer, you know the bitterness of this, don't you? We know it personally. We know it realistically in our lives. No longer will there be a stinger of death. 
it no longer will have authority in our lives because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so what is sown as something which is perishable, Paul is saying, is going to be raised as something which is imperishable. What, what is sown as something which is in, in dishonor is now going to be raised in, in glory. What is sown as a body that is, is broken in its weakness is going to be raised as a body in, in, in power. What is sown as a natural body is going to be raised as a spiritual body someday because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's why we're here, to celebrate and to, to acknowledge what Christ has done. This is why he could speak of this resurrection as being a victory, as being something that ultimately and culminates in his resurrection that brings a successful ending to what God fully intended for us, to be able to raise us up from the dead. Death has no sting. It has no authority. Death, the result of the fall of humanity, no longer has, can speak to the reality of our lives. I look forward to the day when there won't be any more nursing homes. There won't be any more hospice, hospitals to attend. There are cancer centers. You won't be traveling to MD Anderson or to the Fondren Clinic to have your joints replaced. You won't be going to dialysis or radiation or chemotherapy. There won't be any blood pressure issues or lung transplants or bypass surgeries or hip or knee replacements. And listen, I'm excited about there won't be any dental visits anymore. <laughs> you know, amen. Listen. Because, there, because of Christ, there will be no more funerals to attend. There will be no more cemeteries. When we get to heaven, there will be no cemetery in which we will, we will, uh, we will walk into. Because death, hell, and the grave have been defeated. Christ Jesus has done this for us. Amen? Amen. Ground your faith in the promises of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But lastly, I want us to look at the strength that emerges from the resurrection. There's the practical application of what Paul is talking about. Notice in verse 58, he says this, Therefore, my beloved brothers, therefore, that is based upon what I've said to you, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord, that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In other words, it's worth it. L remain steadfast in your faith. Don't let anything shake you from it. Believe. Trust. Understand. This is the strength that he's talking about, right? He's talking about strength that is derived from believing promises. He's talking about scripture that gives us the basis for what we believe. So we believe the scripture and the revelation of Jesus Christ. Based upon the scripture itself, we have strength that emerges from the promise. And the promise is this, is that based upon his resurrection from the dead, we can be immovable in our faith. We can stand steadfast, immovable, abounding thriving, knowing that our lives live for the Lord Jesus Christ, our lives that will not be lived in vain. Our lives are lived with purpose and a sense of destiny and a sense of knowing and understanding what God's plan is for our life. Nothing but the power of the resurrection can give you what it takes to stand. Nothing but the power of the resurrection can give you what it takes to stand strong and unwavering, even thriving when death and sickness and adversity summons you into the arena and calls you to this place in which you must, you must have to deal with the reality of death and sickness and adversity. But know this, that when you step into that arena, you have a victorious warrior, a gladiator who stands in the arena, who bears forever in his body the wounds of Golgotha, but stands victorious over the grave, Stand to your feet and give your king praise and glory and tribute today. Stand today as we worship the Lord Jesus Christ and we acknowledge him. How do we live in the light of the truth of the resurrection? We stand. We stand as those who have faith in Christ Jesus. And so we stand as people who walk in the victory of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
walk in the victory that Christ has provided. Stand in the truth that Christ has provided. It's resurrection day, amen? Let us worship the Lord. As we walk in that victory that Christ has provided for us, we offer you this opportunity to confess him. The Bible says, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. That all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That all who, who cry out to him, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, can be saved today. Do you believe that? Do you believe that by confessing this Jesus who died and who rose again, by confessing him as your Savior, do you believe that you will be saved based upon that confession in Christ? Amen? Amen. We want to give you the opportunity. These men are going to be standing here in this invitation. And let us worship our King this morning because he deserves our worship. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for all your provision. God, we ask that you would help us to walk in the truth of it. Lord, to walk, to walk in the truth of it and the strength of it, to be those people who are immovable, that are abounding in the truth that you have been raised from the dead and that we too one day will be raised from the dead. And Lord God, as we look to your return, we pray that we'll be ready. I pray for each person here today, Lord, that they're ready for that moment. And when you shall return, whenever that day will arrive, that they will be ready, that they will have called upon you. They would have trusted in you as their Savior. So I pray in these moments, Lord, they will call upon your name, for you're the one name that can truly save them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. You come. Come and decision. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Oh, praise. You know, it's resurrection day and I don't want to draw out the service today but look if you can't be excited about this day I don't know what you can be excited about this is our day this is when we know we have victory not because of anything that we've accomplished but because of what Christ has done for us we stand and bask in the victory of our team and our captain is Jesus <laughs> right He's, he's, he is the one who's led us into the victory. That's why we have that victory. And so we thank him. When we worship him, we say, that's, that's what we're doing. We're praising his name. We're exalting his name. We're saying, Lord, thank you. That's what we're saying. And maybe you don't know that victory personally in your life, and that's why we're offering this to you. The gospel of Jesus is that the good news is that there is a victory for you if you will confess him. If you'll call upon the name of the Lord. Maybe you've been experiencing some defeat in your life, some areas in your life you feel like, boy, I just feel like um, it's not going well. My Christian life isn't where it needs to be. This is a day to renew your faith. Renew it. Your victory is in Christ. You could never purchase your own salvation. You could never earn your own salvation. But you could certainly trust in Jesus. You could certainly believe in Jesus. Because he's given you overcoming faith. That's an interesting word. We have victory in Jesus. It's the word nikeo or niko, right? Some of y'all know what that term means. We are more than conquerors is the idea. We don't just win. We conquer in Christ Jesus. That's the idea. It's overcomer's faith. The capacity to have something that God's given us 
that sustains us in the midst of the battles that we find ourselves in in the course of our weeks, in our days here on this earth. Our bodies remind us of this. They tell us that this world is not, we're not destined for this world ultimately. They remind, they remind us that we're broken, that we're perishable. But one day this perishable is going to give up to the imperishable. One day that day is going to happen. So let's sing this chorus again. Let's praise the name of the Lord as we conclude this service. We'll be here after the service to speak with you if you'd like to speak any, with any one of us. But let's, let's sing this chorus in conclusion. Oh, praise the name. Sounds good. Perfect. That's okay. Do what you got to do. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Right. You can just set them down right there. <laughs> 